So we've covered the line city, now it's time for the cube city. So I think it's good to start first, before we look at the cube city, at the overall project in Saudi Arabia, because this is what I think is in store for the future in a lot of other countries. And this is sort of a pilot study for future developments in the rest of the world. And of course, I think diversifying the Saudi oil money, because of course we're moving away from oil to renewable energy, perhaps rather suicidally in both of our opinions. Um, but um, I found this really interesting, and I think you will as well, because there's a weird combination of dystopia and utopia here. Um, and I, I'm very interested to see how it plays out, because I'm a fan of science fiction, and I feel like this is the kind of thing that would be the backdrop to a science fiction film of some kind. Most utopias are degenerated dystopias. And I, as I referenced last time when we covered The Lion City, it looks like a map from Destiny. And the, the plot of Destiny, I don't know if you played it. No. So the idea is this gigantic orb comes into Earth's orbit and grants humanity all these sorts of technologies which uh, extend life, resurrect the dead, uh, means that we can create matter out of thin air. It's brilliant. And then suddenly this weird dark force comes in its wake because it was running away from it and degenerates the whole of society into this apocalyptic wasteland where, where Earth is populated by these dormant super weapons that could go off at any time and there's these weird aliens roaming the plains and you see the remnants of this beautiful great civilization overgrown with weeds and inhabited by strange wolf-like alien scavengers. I think that's what we're going to end up getting if we try and construct all these gilded cages. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the overall project is called Neom, which I think um, comes... Neom. Uh, <laughs> it's the sound of a car driving past. No, um, this is what it says on their website. The name Neom is derived from two words envisioned by His Royal Highness Mohammed bin Salman, Crown oh, Prince and trust. Chairman of the Neom Company Board of Directors. The first three letters come from the ancient Greek prefix Neo, meaning new, and M, from, uh, is the first from mustakbal, um, an Arabic word meaning future. So it's new future, basically. And that's what it means. Um, so this is going to be in a province in northwestern Saudi Arabia. And all of these projects are planned to be built by 2030, which, um, if you're clued up on your ec World Economic Forum knowledge, is a pretty significant date. Well, particularly the UN, because there are 17 sustainable development goals, which the World Economic Forum based its donut mm -hmm. economic model of, of socialist sustainability on, mm -hmm. is 2030. That's why every country subscribed to those goals has policies for 2030. Mm -hmm. Like in Britain, we're getting rid of petrol cars because mm -hmm. that won't have any consequences. Yeah. So as, as you can see, they've got a website up where they're displaying um, all the sorts of things they're doing. And as John's uh, scrolling through, um, you can see there's, there's his definition. I think if you go up, John, there's a little map of all of the different sites, and I'm going to go through what they're planning to build. It is, um, or perhaps it's, oh, there, there, it is. there it is. So um, I don't know why it's so blurry. It's not meant to be that blurry. But basically, there's one on the coast, and it's, it's coincidentally in a line. And then the line is going to be parallel to these sites, the line city, that is. So just to uh, remind you of our coverage, um, here is um, our coverage. Both me and you did this um, originally. I think this was your segment. Wasn't it was, it? yes. Um, titled Saudi Arabia's Rat Utopia, um, where we discussed the Line City. And basically, it's a 170 kilometer linear city that will house 9 million people. There will be no cars or roads, um, only walking and public transport. It's basically a, uh, a 15 minute city, isn't it? Akin In a to... series of grids. Like yes. you will be locked within your 15 minute district within the line. The walls are mirrors, but they're trying to create a nature reserve. So it's going to have loads of dead birds flying into it at all times. Um, you can only escape by train. So obviously, if you have a social credit system, you say the wrong thing. Like um, mm -hmm. the Prophet Muhammad did some unspeakable things in the Hadiths, then you won't be able to leave. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can eat is they have internal gardens that are entirely 100% vegetables, and you'll get that drone delivered to you by a subscription service. So again, if you say the wrong thing about Mr. Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, you won't eat. Funny that, isn't it? And I yeah. mean, I wouldn't trust Saudi Arabia with my right to live as well, because they're not exactly known for being champions of so-called human rights. I mean, I am kind of happy of cutting the hands off thieves, but I will. <laughs> I mean, nobody's perfect. <laughs> So yeah, um, the area around the Lion City and in the general area where all of these projects are going on is going to be rewilded and eventually managed as a nature reserve. So yeah, it's, it's very much in keeping with a lot of this globalist um, stuff. I mean, I'm all for protecting nature, obviously, yeah. and making sure that we don't allow our, our lands to become barren wastelands. 
like but, the um, Saudi desert already yeah. is. Point well, is, this though, is the northwestern region, which is slightly more temperate. To be oh, fair. but they are they are trying to green the desert. Like that is a deliberate policy, and mm -hmm. it is working in some cases. And the reason it's working is because we have an abundance of carbon in the atmosphere. Like if you stop all carbon-based human activity, including eliminating quite a few humans, as Jane Goodall says, she wants to go back to about 500,000 people, which is mental. Uh, no, sorry, 500 million people. 500,000 wouldn't put it past them, though. Then what are the plants going to feed on? You're going to have a mass extinction event of all this new greenery that we've had rise up since the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So, talking of something that seems like either a dream or a nightmare, I have a, uh, a contemplations here, talking about the nature of dreams. Smooth. So I very much suggest you check that out. It was very good. Thank you very much. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it over the years, just the nature of dreams, and I've also brought in some neuroscience, some different perspectives on it, as well as just examining um, my anecdotal experiences, because this is one of those areas where, you know, your your lived experience um, is actually very useful in understanding the nature of the thing. I also wouldn't be surprised if all these infrastructure projects source was it came to me in a dream. <laughs> well. Talking of these infrastructure projects, let's start going through some of them. So this is the Oxagon, um, which is the industrial centre they're building. So it's not all going to be tourism. I think that this is actually going to be the thing that pulls its weight out of all the projects. So this is um, based on the Red Sea coast down from the Suez Canal. Um, and of course, the Suez Canal sees about 13% of all world trade. So it's actually a very clever place to put something, although I'm sure they're aware that it's a good place to have trade on that coast because it has been for the past um, 3,000 years. Mm. But um, this is meant to be, um, this is the concept, of course, they've not built it yet, the world's largest floating structure, which seems pretty um, expensive to me if you're trying to create industry. And one of the things that you need to have successful industry is low overhead costs. You don't want, say, facilities that are floating on water it seems like it's going to artificially inflate the cost of production because the the upkeep, the cost of building the buildings itself on water is going to be more than building them on land because we don't live in that, I forgot the name of the, uh, is it Waterworld, that 1990s Yeah, film. Kevin Costner movie. Yes. Yeah. We don't live in Waterworld. <laughs> there is land. Um, it's right there. It's desert. You're not, you're not really going to lose out on much. Just, just build on the land. So See, this vanity aspect seems like they're sabotaging one of the few sensible aspects of this whole thing. So I don't... Yes, vanity, definitely, because otherwise it wouldn't be built like a hexagon to be seen from space or whatever. But there is something quite subversively clever about this, and that is that if this structure is built so precariously, it requires quite a lot of defence to maintain it. Because if you were in a conflict scenario and they just bombed the connecting bit, then wouldn't that just drift off or at least be liable to flooding? So that means that they have to position quite a lot of their defences and possibly their allies' defences if they're going into bricks, around that site. And that means right at the exit of the Suez Canal, the Saudi military will have quite a large station. So they'll have control mm -hmm. over the trade route in the area. So I think parallel to this would be sort of the, the bottom half of Egypt, Ethiopia, mm. that sort of area. So um, I don't know. I'm not as clued in to well, On the Saudi geopolitics of the region. No, yeah. but it is. they are definitely the dominant power in that region. Sure, yeah, definitely. So... There's also Trojena, I think it's pronounced, or Trojena, I don't know how you pronounce it in Arabic. But this is a year-round mountain ski resort, um, and it, it looks... Oh, this is for the Davos types, definitely. It, it certainly is, yes. Um, so this is um, one of the sites that they are set to host the 2029 Asian Winter Games as well, so that's part of the reason they're building this in the first place. Can't wait not to watch. I'm sure mad old Klaus will get his, get his skis on. Mm -hmm. But I... When you think of skiing, you think of the Alps, you think of continental Europe, don't you? Yeah, you think of places that have snow. Yes. Not Saudi Arabia. Um, <laughs> so I feel like it's going to be a difficult sell, um, unless it's going to be one of those things where the elite go there and it's not really a sort of average person tourism destination, I mean, if they which want, I could certainly see. If we wanted a low-cost way of blanketing it, they could just get Michael Gove to sneeze. <laughs> I don't think many people are going to get that, but I did. Um, so there's also another picture here of it um, when it's not snowy, um, and it just looks like a park, I suppose, um, on top of a building. But it looks weirdly sort of dystopian. I don't mm. know. I, I'm not a fan of the design of it. Mm. Um, it looks like the kind of thing that turtles will get their necks stuck in. Yeah, it, it looks like a thing to hold beer, <laughs> which in Saudi Arabia, you need a lot more of. Yeah. 
Um, so another thing is Sindala, um, which is going to be an island resort um, yeah. with a focus on yachting. And this is definitely for the elites, isn't it? I was going to say that. They just can park like their a... yacht. They can go into their nice luxury hotel. That's on a two brochure. Yeah. On an island which will probably only admit people with a net worth of multi-millions, right? Yeah. I think the green area back there is a Trump golf course. <laughs> it might as well be. But yes, this is clearly um, a way of attracting big money. Um, it is worth mentioning as well that Saudi Arabia, if you ignore the continents of the Americas, is basically in the center of the rest of the world. Mm. So it is well positioned for tourism um, in a geographic sense, although I would say that the culture and uh, fact that it's a desert, probably not good selling points, in that when I go on holiday, I like a pint, I like a cold beer. Well, in Saudi Arabia, you can't do that. And who are the people that tend to go on holiday? Well. Westerners, people who drink alcohol. Um, You're not going to get Baz from Benidorm holidaying in Saudi Arabia, though. No, although you, you might get the Dubai types. Oh, yeah, the, the Dino influence is true. See, I think, because these are basically mini satellite states in the desert, I think you're going to get their own in individual legal cultures because the, the Islamic world is, of course, going to say mm -hmm. it's fine for the Kafars to do it over there. Well, I, I researched that because I thought that might be the case as well. And supposedly, they have no exceptions in all of Saudi Arabia for the alcohol. I thing. wonder if even, that's going to change. Even people who supply alcohol are just as culpable as the people who drink it. So mm. I think that it, they might have to change that if this is to be successful, if they're reliant on tourism, because I, I can't see, unless people are going to be smuggling in bottles of expensive French wine on they their might yachts. Be, they might be doing what Turkey does. This is pure speculation. But um, So the reason Turkey was one of the first countries to lift its lockdown requirements was because of the tourism industry and Erdogan was running inflation at about 80%. And they said the only way that we can reverse our economic course where you've got police officers going around shops and setting the price of biscuits like they're Soviet commissars is if we allow the Brits back. And so he went, fine, fine, fine. But because I'm trying to enforce more Islamism and undo the secular reforms that the Turks have adopted and made us a bit more prosperous, I'm going to levy, I think it's like a 30% tax on all alcohol. And so you can go out to Turkey and everything is super cheap out there. I think it's something like 20 odd lira to a pound and um, water bottles are one lira, but alcohol, all the drinks are very expensive. It's something like 20 quid for a cocktail. Or, so it rinses. you. Blimey. Yeah. It's like, that's worse it's like drinking London. in London. It is it's like worse than London. London. Yeah. So here's a, a video that um, James Melville shared of, um, this is a promotional video of the, the cube itself. Um, uh, I <laughs> I don't think it would get planning permission in the West. There's also a structure in the middle there that looks like um, the stack of dishes in my student house. <laughs> it looks like tumbling monkeys. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is inside, and th there's going to be a great big lift up to the, the top, and the, the whole of the inside is going to be covered in a great big um, LED screen so they can project various things. So it's going to be things like the surface of Mars, the sky, like... You can see there. Or whichever advert. That that's a towel dropship. <laughs> what the hell is it? This is a Halo map. Like on the it outside, does, yeah. they're gonna the, the giant holograms from Blade Runner 2049. Mm -hmm. The outside they're just gonna have the weird also, Asian woman um, drinking coke. <laughs> they've they've got um, a flying car racetrack being built on the roof. Now it this is also pod racing. <laughs> and they're gonna project it being underwater. So the idea is that being inside, it's not going to feel like you're in a building, it's going to feel like you are in a, a different world. That's the, the concept that they're trying to go for. Right, okay. Which is, I mean, I can't, even though I think that it's probably too, too big to succeed, I, I can't help but think, Wow, that is, that is kind of cool, isn't it? No, it, it's trying Come to convince on. you that your gilded cage is somewhat novelty. I, they don't lock you in there. I mean, You, you, you don't can, believe they're going to lock you in there? <laughs> Saudi Arabia, with full technological control, really? They're not going to force you to go. It's basically just like a luxury tourist destination. So they're not going to be like, oh... You've come here on holiday, now you're, you're never going to they leave. absolutely are. And you're going to I'm hear not... the call to prayer blasted throughout the entire Golden Cube. I don't necessarily think today. this is a good idea, but I'm interested to see how it's going to play out because the, the, the technological aspects seem kind of cool. My sci-fi brain is just like, oh, I want to see this. I want to see how it plays out. I've seen all the films. I've seen, all the, I've seen Blade Runner. This is the second worst cube to be locked in, and the other one has Philip Schofield in it. <laughs> if you're outside of Britain... You won't get that, but okay. So here is an article from Forbes explaining Saudi Arabia's new mammoth cube-shaped city. So 
It says the sprawling mega, pro mega project is the size of 20 Empire State buildings and comes complete with racetracks for flying cars, immersive experiences that mimic visits to other planets. In the Saudi Arabian capital of Riyadh, uh, plans are underway to build a massive city within a city complete with racetracks. For yeah, you've just said that article. Sorry. <laughs> Forgot to admit that. Introducing the Maqab, which is derived from the Arabic word for cube, this sprawling me mega project will act as a centerpiece to surrounding new Maraba project, which aims to expand the footprint of the capital to house an estimated 350,000 residents over 4,695 acres. The promotional image of that looks like the poster for Armageddon. <laughs> like, could you not be more dystopian if you tried? It does look like a nuclear bomb's going off in the distance. Yeah, it looks like it? an asteroid impact. Mm -hmm. But Imagine living close to this, and <laughs> you're just living in the eternal shadow of this giant cube. Well, we've we've had construction work outside the window of our office, because Swindon Council, see the last segment as to why they're so useless, has dragged this out for months now. Imagine that being built near your home. Mm -hmm. For about 10 years yeah. as well. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's not exactly in keeping with the... Uh, Village's rustic aesthetic. <laughs> I, I was going to say something slightly different. I mean, They're building the cube for the greater good. <laughs> it's, it's not something from Hot Fuzz. Um, but I, I think they've at least tried to keep it in keeping with um, some of the culture's patterns on the outside because that's a traditional um, sort of Arabian pattern on the outside. The, the triangle's there. It's got a specific name that I've forgotten. Um, but I'm going to carry on reading from this. It says the Macab will reach 1,312 feet in height and provide a mixture of residences, hotels, office space and open air parks and walkways. Indoor holographic projections such as giant sized people pictured above will create the immersive futuristic experiences of the space. The cost of the project has not been disclosed, but it is funded by um, public investment fund, the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, with the goal of regenerating a project um, 800 billion reals, which is 48 billion US dollars of revenue and several hundred thousand jobs, according to the public statement. Um, most crucially for Saudi Arabia, the revenue won't be directly tied to the oil industry and can help both attract foreign investment as well as tourist income. And they're hoping to open in 2030. Um, so, yes, this is very, very, very ambitious. I think that's a fair thing to say, isn't it? It will be a Judge Dredd hellscape within a generation. Mm -hmm. So one of the claims that I thought was a bit strange is that they're claiming that it's going to be both built and ran in an eco-friendly and renewable way, which seems strange to me coming from Saudi Arabia, because I think it's going to have a similar situation to the Qataris in that they're going to be getting foreign labor, cheap labor from abroad. I think the Qataris used Indians a lot of the time. And they're going to basically work them to death in contracts where they can't escape and they're going to bury their corpses underneath this giant cube where loads of rich people are going to have projections of their dystopia. Like a Soviet canal. Yes. So the workforce is biodegradable. Apparently so. So that must be where the eco impact comes from. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. I didn't think about it like yeah. that. But in a country that produces a lot of oil, you would think that they'd be like, well, screw you. It's not like they're going to curry favour the, with the West. They're Saudi Arabia. I mean, they're friendly-ish. They're, they're not hostile to the United States, for example, but they have been distancing well, themselves from them in recent years as well. I think they're playing both sides of where mm -hmm. they want to court the investment capital from the WEF by committing to the 2030 Green Agenda, but also they're going to sell oil to BRICS. It's funny you say that, because if we go to this next um, article, um, it says, um, this is from Design Boom, and this is a quote here. I can say we have finished what amounts to 20% of NEOM's infrastructure and work is ongoing in 2023, Al Nasser told um, international Arabic news outlet Al Arabia um, at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Here we are. Take off your bingo card. Yes. Um, it does seem to be a WEF influence project to, to my mind. So of course they're going to lock mm -hmm. you in. Well, I think if it's going for tourism, it's going to be a very unsustainable project if they're like, yes, you've come here on holiday, now you can't leave. How how can you be a tourist with 15-minute cities? Tourism is just a smokescreen, mm -hmm. 100%. They're going to lock you in. It, it does seem strange. I suppose if they get all of those annoying Instagram influencers to fly out there like Dubai and then they lock them in, I will actually support this project wholeheartedly. <laughs> the Love Island gilded cage. <laughs> all right, you're winning the round. Yeah, well, like I said, this is a, a more nuanced thing than you might imagine. Yeah. Um, but yes, um, 
the obvious elephant in the room here is they're targeting 2030, but yet they've got, what, five mega projects here? I think it amounts to 10 in total in Saudi Arabia being built all at the same time. How are they going to afford that? I mean, there's also the fact that almost all projects tend to run over budget, and this is an exorbitantly expensive vanity project um, for the entirety of Saudi Arabia. Are they just going to run out of money and it's going to be like a Chinese city thing where they build it? It's basically an empty skeleton that is just a sign of government mismanagement. And they have to tear it down in 10 years. Yes, it could well go that way because I know Saudi Arabia has a lot of money from oil, but it's not enough to do all of this. They need to get foreign investment. They need to borrow money. And that could be throttled. If they, say, alienate the United States, their influence alone could tank all of this. This could just be to get their GDP economic activity number up on the sheet. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a very, very risky solution. They, could, they should have just gone for something smaller, in my opinion, because the risk of this is going to disincentivize investment. And if you disincentivize investment, you're not going to be able to build it and it's going to fail. So some smaller steps, one at a time maybe, would have made more sense. But doing it all at the same time seems, to my mind, suicidal. It seems like it's lots of yes men saying, yes, Mr. Bin Salman, this is all going to work out. And then he's going to find out, oh, I'm basically worth nothing now. Yeah, but I've if you say no, money. you get cut up in little pieces in a Turkish embassy. <laughs> yes, they, they don't have a good track record of uh, treating government employees particularly well, do they? No. Um, so um, this statement from Al, Al Nasser um, has been vindicated by the fact that there is drone footage. So if you, you can see um, in this YouTube thumbnail here that they've already started building the foundations of the, the line already in the desert. It looks like they're excavating it from the sand. Yes, so I think they're, they're going to bury in the foundations into the sand because, of course, you probably need deep foundations if you're going to build on sand. I mean, there's... I'm sure there's a good analogy there. Yeah, please read Ozymandias, people. <laughs> so um, there's, they've also been advertising for jobs, um, and this made me laugh. Neom Jobs, Saudi megacity hiring prison guards and bankers. Prison guards, I told you. <laughs> I just thought um, this article was funny. It is, it is also worth pointing out in this final article um, that they are hiring normal stuff as well. Um, so fresh graduates, architects, marketing experts wanted in Saudi Arabia, which is far more of a normal thing. But I just thought that that former one was quite funny to include. Because yeah, the two worst people on earth, prison guards and bankers. <laughs> Where are the lawyers? Are they facilitating the whole thing? I Saudi guess. Arabia are in dire need of traffic wardens. <laughs> but yes, this is something to keep an eye on because I think there's lots of interesting aspects to it. One, sort of association with the World Economic Forum. Two, the... The, trying to push the the edge of human technology. Three, it could be the bankrupting of Saudi Arabia. Mm. And four, this is probably where many of our leaders are going to get their ideas from if it seems like it's actually going to be a successful thing. I can't wait to be a member of the Borg. Yes. So hopefully <laughs> this isn't the way society is going to go, but I am kind of interested. and I, I, I want some of it to succeed because it seems cool. But on the other hand, I want to also stick my middle finger up to the World Economic Forum. So I'm a little bit torn because I want to see how it all pans out because it's interesting, is it? You can't deny that, can We're you? fine if the foreigners screw up over there. I mean, it's but Saudi Arabia. It. If the Saudi Arabians rinse all their money building vanity projects, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it, am I? It, I mean, if anything, it's, it's kind of a good thing. So make of that what you will, but certainly keep an eye on it because it is a very interesting development in the the world, and I think that the World Economic Forum is certainly going to be keeping an eye on its success. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site, such as the Epoch series, this episode on William Wilberforce. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.